the session is uh, by Martin Rolfs, uh, graded symmetry groups. Um, it's the subtitle is plain and simple, and uh, maybe Stephen could also come up and we can see the people who were involved in this work. Um, do you have the camera facing towards them? These are uh, Dr. Plain, uh, no, no, Mr. Plain and Dr. Simple, right? In the, yeah, yeah. Okay, Martin, uh, take it away. Uh, 55 minutes and then the questions. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about our uh, paper, Great Simple Groups, Plain and Simple. Um, and in the talk by Stephen a couple of days ago, he talked about uh, the plain part and he left the simple part uh, to me. Um, or put differently, uh, he did the geometric and I did the algebra today. Um, something else I would also like to mention is, uh, so as some of you know, yesterday was my birthday. And... Um, I didn't know the content of Anthony's talk yet beforehand, but he couldn't have given me a nicer birthday gift today because I think the, the links between the two are very interesting and uh, hopefully that will come up a bit as well today. Um, I have to use the keys, unfortunately, um, but I'll make do. So first I'll give an introduction and for those who didn't see Stephen's talk, I will uh, go back um, to mention the most important points of that. Um, and then that brings me to the more algebraic part of the invariant decomposition, um, which is a uh, decomposition um, of uh, rotors or um, uh, isometries in general. So in the recap of Stephen's talk, I'll uh, first start by uh, describing reflections and high reflections. Um, and these will be the atoms of isometries. Um, and that then can be extended to K reflections. Um, and we will also describe um, that simple elements uh, are the elements of geometry. Um, and then when we really uh, get going with the invariant decomposition, we will find that if you take a product of 2k plus 1 reflections, uh, that is uh, the product of a commuting reflection and a 2k reflection. And this 2k reflection, as we will show, can be decomposed again into these phi reflections. Um, and I will spend quite a bit of time to explain this in the context of um, four reflections in 4D, so rotors in 4D, um, which has some very uh, interesting subspaces, namely STA and 3D PGA. So the introduction is as follows. We, we start from Hamilton's observation that all isometries can be generated by composing reflections. And then we stick with that and we see it through um, to see what the conclusions are. So as an example, consider the uh, Euclidean plane in which if we don't do any reflections, that is just the identity operation that leaves the entire plane unchanged. Um, but if we do a single reflection, um, that is, of course, just a reflection, but two reflections become a rotation or a translation. And I will illustrate this in a moment. Um, three reflections can also be combined, and then we get a new isometry, which is called the glide reflection. But if we go to four, uh, carton jelenet theorem kicks in, and that really just becomes the same again as just doing two, so just a rotation or a translation. Um, and I will give illustrations for this. Mm -hmm. um, with each of these isometries are associated invariants, right? So under identity, if you don't do anything, the entire plane will just remain invariant. But under a reflection in 2D, you reflect over a line. So the entire space mirrors except for that line. So that is then the invariant. <laughs> and under a rotation, that's where the two lines intersect. The intersection is a point and that will be left invariant. And the glide reflection, interestingly enough, has two invariants. It leaves uh, a line invariant, the, the line of the uh, reflection, but it also leaves an infinite point invariant. So I'll start with this animation. Um, when you combine two reflections, um, it is only the relative angle between the two that matters and the uh, intersection. But other than that, you can see that we can just vary these freely, so that leaves an internal gauge degree of freedom, and they still will form uh, the same net transformation of these triangles.
I don't know why it stops responding. Um, when you take two parallel reflections, so we make these two reflections parallel, the same thing will happen. Um, there is still that gauge degree of freedom because all of these parallel lines will give the same transformation and the invariant is the point on the horizon. So it's rotating about that point on the horizon. So in 2D, we reflect in a line. In 3D, we notice from the mirror we have at home, you reflect in a plane. And in ND, you therefore reflect in a hyperplane. And in a pseudo-Euclidean space, uh, EPQ, hyperplanes satisfy a linear equation of the form AX plus BY, et cetera, plus this delta, which is the offset from the origin, equals zero. And we can represent that as a vector. So if I now take um, a geometric algebra with signature R, PQ1, where I have one extra basis vector which squares to zero, and the other ones I have P that squared to plus one and Q that squared to negative one, then I can actually represent this hyperplane purely as a vector. And in order to reflect in a hyperplane, we then use conjugation, right? So if I have a hyperplane W and I want to reflect it in a hyperplane V, you just use the conjugation formula uh, that we used. And this minus sign here appears uh, because of the orientation. We expect that if you uh, reflect in a mirror in itself, it's, it's front and back side flip. So the orientation should flip, and that explains the minus sign. Um, now, what you see here is, of course, if these uh, two reflections start to overlap, so it becomes the same one, that's the same as doing nothing. So um, we know that reflections are involuntary, um, which uh, thus means that we just demand that um, applying the same reflection twice on W should leave W unchanged. And from that, we find that V squared um, shouldn't be equal to plus or negative one. Um, and the same goes for uh, V inverse squared. Um, the plus or minus one, it should really just be a scalar in this case, um, but we additionally chose it to be one for simplicity. Um, so then we arrive at the famous cartan jordan theorem, and that is that when you combine uh, K different reflections, you have K minus one of these gauges. So you can rotate about each of these intersections. And that means you can actually align these such that two of these reflections turned out to be the same one, and that cancels. So now we see that what appear to be four reflections at first is really just two reflections. I can just get to that state with only two. Maybe I'll let that play out one more time. So each of the, this is the important part. You can just freely rotate about these intersections, and we can use that to make some of them disappear. All right, so um, in a geometric algebra, uh, RPQR then, um, the formal definition of the cartan jordan theorem is uh, if the dimension of this algebra is n, which is the sum of P, Q, and R, we can combine at most n reflections um, before cartan jordan kicks in, which is that every orthogonal transformation of an n-dimensional space can be decomposed into at most n reflections in hyperplanes where again, the cancellation happens because doing the same reflection twice is the same as doing nothing. Um, and that brings me to the bi-reflections, the composition of two reflections. So that is, for example, a rotation as depicted here. Um, and again, the only thing that um, unites all of these uh, different versions of the uh, bi-reflection that I'm showing is the intersection point here. And so mathematically, what it looks like is if you do the sandwich, you get a uh, reflection first in V and then in U. Uh, if we work that out, we find uh, UV um, acting on some element A. And so UV is what we call a bi-reflection for simplicity. Um, the important thing is that all of the um, transformations you see here in this image, they all leave this intersection point invariance. And so if you have one of these bi-reflections, if I would just freeze the image right now, 
um, I could use that as a representation of the whole family because by repeated multiplication, you can get this whole uh, set of transformations. And you might think that when they become parallel, that is no longer the case. But if you consider, for example, these tram lines here, so I first reflect over these first two tram lines uh, to uh, translate the uh, um, triangle, and I do it again, and I do it again. All of these tram lines meet at the same point in, at infinity. So in fact, um, they also belong to the same continuous uh, family and they are related to each other. And there's one, uh, they are, you might think that they are no longer, uh, it's no longer possible to find an orthogonal representation of, of that point at infinity, but in fact you can, because we also have the horizon itself as one of the vectors, that is E0, the one that squares to zero. So therefore I can just take, for example, my, uh, y basis vector intersected with E0, and that gives me a pure bi, uh, bi vector, which represents this point on the horizon. And that is the invariant of all these transformations. So by reflections, in principle, if I have one of them, uh, by uh, taking that to the power of T, uh, we know that they are all part of the same one parameter family. Um, and so you only need one to represent the entire subgroup. Um, and the only thing, as I've hopefully uh, demonstrated, the only thing they all share in common is the invariant intersection um, between the two reflections. Um, and so that is U wedge B. But as I showed in the image just now, you can always find a U prime and a V prime, which are already orthogonal to one another. So I can just write this with a geometric product. And then from that, it follows that um, if I define a pi vector B, which is the logarithm, um, it follows that B squared, because this, this pi vector B is, this, uh, is proportional to this U wedge B, um, it will always square to a scalar because I can find two orthogonal um, uh, reflections with the same intersection. And therefore it's quite straightforward to show that it always squares to a scalar. Um, and this logarithm is the invariant itself. Um, and so since we know that this R, the, the bi-reflection is now e to the power b, where b is a bi-vector, um, I will just define the scalar part, um, so that's u dot v, um, as a generalized cosine, and the bi-vector part as a generalized sine formula, which we write with the C and S for simplicity. And the key point here is, is that this, um, this, way, this way of writing it is completely exception-free. Because if this lambda is uh, a positive number, then this will be a Cauch function. If lambda is negative, we will get uh, an imaginary solution, which, which transforms it into a cosine. If it's zero, then uh, this will just be one, and uh, this term here with the sink function, so that's like the normal sink function, but for the hyperbolic case, um, also covers all the cases. So that is the neat way to write them all into one uh, equation. And we will find that these, this definition of C and B is very useful in the re remainder of this talk for easy manipulation of all the cases. Um, so these bi-reflections always then follow a generalized Euler's formula. We have some scalar quantity, which is the C of B, and uh, the sine part. Um, and if I just take C out of the brackets here, um, you find that I can also write this as one plus a tangent function, the generalized version of the tangent, which is just uh, S divided by C in the ordinary way. And this uh, tangent will come up a lot uh, later on in the talk. Now, Knowing all of this, we can just uh, say what the logarithm is for a simple bi-reflection. Um, so what is this bi-vector B, the, the logarithm? Um, if you have a B which doesn't square to zero, then you simply take the bi-vector part, you normalize it, and you undo the cosh in the uh, scalar part um, to get the correct logarithm. If the bi-vector squared to zero, so that is for a translation, then it is just simply the bi-vector part already. So now I can go to the definition of a k-reflection. or um, So that is the, the product of k of these reflections, and they satisfy the, the rotor condition that r, r tilde is plus or minus one. Um, 
And in the particular case where they all square to one and K is even, then this K reflection is part of the uh, rotor uh, subgroup. Um, so any K reflection is an element of what we in group theory would call pin PQ. And we extend it with an R to uh, allow for this degenerate metric. And rotors are then also an element of spin PQR, right? They are even uh, sub algebra elements. Now, a K reflection is considered simple if it squares to a scalar. So its square only contains a scalar part. And these are the K blades in this case. So um, the wedge product of K hyperplanes or equivalently, as we've seen, the product of K orthogonal hyperplanes. Um, the fact that this then squares to a scalar follows immediately from the fact that this wedge can alternatively be written uh, as a geometric product of orthogonal ones. And so again, um, the square follows quite straightforwardly. Um, and in any dimensions, uh, these are the elements of geometry. So those would be the planes, lines, points, etc. Um, so just a quick uh, illustration again. Um, if I have a single plane, um, that, uh, sorry, a single reflection that can rep be used to represent the plane. If I do two, we have this intersection here, which is a line. And if I combine three of them, they intersect in a point. And so that is used to then represent a point. Yeah, okay. That was actually expected behavior. Um, <laughs> so um, now I can go towards try reflections and that's where things start to get interesting. So if I consider three reflections in the plane, again, in the two dimensional Euclidean plane, we have two of these gauges. And using those gauges, we can again do the same trick that we did by rotating about these gauge invariants until the, um, so I'll just let it play again. So I have a gauge degree of freedom at this point and one there that we could use. So we first rotate about this one until it's orthogonal here. Then we start changing our pivot point. And now these two lines become parallel. So that gives you a translation. And we have the other reflection left here. So it is a reflection along the blue axis followed by a translation along that uh, axis. And um, so in equation form, there will be, if you have any product of three different reflections, uh, you can simplify that to two, um, to a bi-reflection u prime v prime and a w prime, which is a reflection, and those commute. And it turns out that the commuting factor, that the commuting reflection, is just given by the vector part of this p. So you can pop that, that one out quite easily, and then you divide it out, and you are left with the bi-reflection, which commutes with this w prime. And the interesting thing is that that is a general property. So always, if you have an odd number of reflections, you can always take the vector part of P. That will give you a reflection which commutes with whatever is left over, and that will be a 2K reflection. So we will just need to focus on the 2K reflections for the remainder of this talk to see what goes on there. So by the same token, if I have four different <laughs> reflections, that would be an even one. Um, I can, I hopefully have, have shown you enough to convince you that indeed we will still have these gauges to manipulate, and with that, um, if I have a product U1, V1, U2, V2, there exists a U1 prime, V1 prime, and the same for U2, um, such that these two terms are now commuting. And because they are simple bi-reflections, I can uh, write this one as E to the V1, and this is E to the V2, but they are commuting. So that means I can just take these exponentials together to form E to the power of V1 plus V2. No... Um, Baker House or Campbell anymore. Um, so this intuitively shows that this quad reflection is generated by a non-simple bifactor B, capital B is B1 plus B2. And that raises a, uh, oh, sorry, one more point. It is non-simple because if I square it, if you just uh, take this for me, you square it, you find B1 squared plus B2 squared, which is a scalar quantity. Um, but this term here, B1 times B2, those are two simple uh, orthogonal uh, by vectors. So that doesn't uh, change and that stays a quad factor. So hence it is non-simple. 
Um, and that brings me to a very interesting conjecture by Marcel Ritz, um, which is that uh, can any bivector be decomposed into the direct sum of mutually orthogonal simple bivectors? And so the hunt is on for these B1 and B2. So if I have a bivector B, how would I go about finding B1 and B2? Um, firstly, I'll start again with the ansatz that they exist now. Um, so again, if I define lambda i, the eigenvalue in the same uh, vein that Anthony uh, had a lambda, um, that is B i squared, which is a scalar quantity. And so again, this B squared is lambda one plus lambda two. Uh, plus this extra term, and we identified it with the dot product of b dot b and b wedge b. And then I can uh, define a characteristic polynomial for finding these b i. So I just um, write this characteristic polynomial b1 minus b i times b2 minus b i. And by definition, the roots of that ought to give me uh, the b i. And so you just multiply it out. I find B1 times B2 minus BI, B1 plus B2 plus BI squared. And this first term, B1, B2, we recognize as a half of B wedge B, right, over here. And um, B1 plus B2, that was just our original B. And uh, this square we call lambda I. And now it's a matter of rearranging to find an expression for BI. So that is just uh, lambda i plus a half b wedge b divided by b. And it's already interesting to remark at this point that for any value of lambda i, this will be a bivector which commutes with the original b. But only if the lambda i is the correct lambda 1, lambda 2 that, that are actually present in that bivector, will it also be simple? So how do we find the values of lambda i then? Um, I take this equation that we just found and I square it. And then you just, after some rearranging, you find this polynomial here, a, a second degree uh, polynomial. And so we know how to solve that. Um, it's just, a, these are both scalar quantities, right? B dot B and B wedge B squared is also a scalar. Um, so we just use the quadratic formula to find that lambda I is given by a half B dot B plus or minus a half B dot B squared minus B wedge B squared. And now, depending on the sign of this discriminant, this could, in principle, have complex solutions as well, which we will uh, discuss later. Now, I should remark that this closed form solution that I just uh, showed you here for BI was previously published. Um, first, in R4, it can be found in uh, Hestinus, um, in um, uh, Clifford's uh, Algebra to Geometric Calculus. Um, for freebie CGA, it was previously published, published by Leo Dorst as well, um, and in uh, freebie PGA by Charles Gunn. Um, but they were arrived at with various different methods for each of these uh, papers. And this approach shows that actually the solution in all of them is indeed the same, and this uh, method finds them. So just to give you an example, uh, and that relates back to the talk that Stephen uh, gave um, on freebie PGA. Uh, the famous mosse Schaal theorem, every three-dimensional rigid body motion can be decomposed as a translation along a line followed or preceded by a rotation around the same line. So what goes on in 3D PGA? Actually, the pseudo-scalar there squares to zero because it contains this E0 bit, which makes it square to zero. And therefore, our B wedge B squared term will just be zero and doesn't have to be considered. So it drops out. And so we find that the solutions are actually just lambda one is B dot B and lambda two is always zero. And that makes it especially uh, straightforward in this case, because that means that for B I, if I just plug in lambda I zero, I find for the first one, I call it B two, uh, that that is just B wedge B divided by two B. And we can find the last one either by plugging in lambda i or just by subtracting, of course. Um, and then what is the geometrical meaning of these? Um, B1 is the Euclidean axis of rotation. And B2 is the orthogonal line at infinity, which goes all the way around. And so it is a uh, translation along that axis plus a rotation around that axis, which is a screw motion. 
And so the most general screw motion for this by vector is that uh, I can take an R1, which is e to the theta v1, which will generate a rotation, and um, R2 to the power t v2 will generate some translation at the same time. Um, now we can go to spacetime algebra. So every Lorentz transformation can be decomposed into a boost along a space-like plane, followed or preceded by a rotation around the same plane. Um, so in 3D PGA, uh, sorry, that should have been SDA now. Uh, I forgot to correct that, um, but the rest is correct. So in STA, the pseudo scalar i, which is gamma naught one, two, three, um, squares to negative one. And thus we find that b wedge b squared is always uh, a negative number. So in that case, uh, we can also use some, some simplifying notions. Um, that means that for this b wedge b squared term, I can just replace that with uh, a plus here and then the magnitude of b wedge b squared. And that has as a result, when you think about it, that one of the lambdas will always be positive and the other one will always have to be negative because this term here will always be greater than the preceding term. And therefore you find that uh, these B1 and B2 are a time-like plane and a space-like plane, which will be invariant under uh, the entire family of Lorentz transformations that this generates. And so again, you get uh, the most general rotation being theta to the power uh, or sorry, e to the theta b2, which is a rotation, and then omega to uh, e to the omega b1, which generates a boost along it. And these commute, just to stress that again. Um, but Mark Saritz, in the original publication, had a very strong counter example, which was quite a, a challenge. Um, what about the space r2,2? So, in 2,2, I have two basis vectors which square to a positive number, and I have two which square to a negative number. And therefore, the pseudo scalar in that space will satisfy uh, that it squares to plus one. And this um, has some interesting consequences. So let's consider uh, this explicit example. So I make this non simple by vector, and if you square it, you find that actually it only has a wedge part, so it only has a quad vector part, which is negative the pseudo scalar. And that means that for our lambda i, I would just find plus or minus a half the square root of negative b wedge b squared, right? But b wedge b squared now will always be positive because the pseudo scalar squares a positive number. So that actually means that the roots will be plus or minus i over 2. So they are complex. And this is what caused uh, Marcel Ries, or also originally, say, if you, if you are in a uh, geometric algebra of the real numbers, then there are no solutions. But let's just uh, entertain the thought that for a second we step out into the complex plane, and I will address later uh, what goes on then, and we just carry on regardless. So what you then find is two uh, complex simple bivectors. Yes. Got to make that one. <laughs> so um, we, we find these B1 and B2, um, which are half of the original B, plus or minus some complex part. And you can see immediately that they are each other's complex uh, conjugates. But if you work it out, they uh, still satisfy all the desired um, conditions. So it still sums to the original B. It still squares to this lambda, which is now this plus or minus uh, I over two. And it's still, when you take their product, it is the same as their wedge product, meaning that the dot is zero, so they are uh, orthogonal, and the commutative product is zero as well, uh, meaning that they commute. And we have now additionally, as I said, that they are just complex conjugates. And the complex conjugate part is important because that means that the sum of uh, B1 and B2 is still real, and the product B1, B2 is also still real. So this might seem counterintuitive at first, but remember that our B was real to begin with, and E to the B will also still be real. We just have to take uh, an intermediate step where it becomes complex. Um, and so if you're willing to, to accept that, um, everything still works. And it basically is just the fundamental theorem of algebra, right? Um, that you have these solutions. Um, now, there could be other things going on here. It could be that if we, uh, that this is actually a hint 
that you should perhaps consider a larger space, for example, so that you have that extra commutating I, because that is the constraint on this one. This I just has to be a commutating uh, unit imaginary. So uh, that, that is something worth uh, keeping in mind and that has to be investigated. Okay, so, so far all is good, right? Uh, all spaces are covered. Um, but there is one notable exception and that is that of isoclinic uh, rotations. So for example, we go back again to our uh, characteristic <laughs> polynomial and we arrive at this point as, as we did before. And let me leave it in, in this solution. So B1B is lambda I plus a half B wedge B. And then what I did before is I um, inverted B, but that is of course um, dependent on the fact that B inverse exists. And so when does B inverse exist? Um, it, well, it is easy to verify that B inverse in this scenario would be B1 minus B2 divided by lambda one minus lambda two. And so when lambda one equals lambda two, there is no inverse and I cannot just invert this relationship and it breaks down. So that is why the isoclinic ro um, rotations are problematic. Um, so in R4, this can happen. Um, in R4, again, we have a pseudo scalar which squares to a positive number. And therefore it is possible for this B dot B here uh, squared minus B wedge B squared to be zero. That could happen. And when that happens, um, the solutions become the same and we've hit this isoclinic uh, point. But we have already found in, in experiments that uh, numerical experiments that you can still find a numerical solution to this equation in principle. If you just stop one step earlier and you demand, I want to find some blade bi that satisfies this, it will still work. So there, the split is still possible, but just not by our closed form solution anymore. Um, and so from this, we can immediately conclude that the two most popular spaces at the moment, the 3D PGA and STA are exception free. They don't have this uh, problem. Um, but exceptions of this type exist in the 4D Euclidean space and in the modern algebra R2.2. All right, so we've managed to do quite a lot. We, we now know how to split uh, non-simple bifactors in 4D, um, but how do I go the opposite direction? If you give me a rotor in 4D, how do I decompose that into the two commuting factors? Um, so we're gonna go the opposite direction now. Um, I already said that. <laughs> so what we do first is we realize that the scalar part, since um, these simple bivectors are just the generalized uh, Euler's formula, um, that the scalar part of a, this rotor R here will just be C of B1 times C of B2. And the bivector part is the S of B1, C, B2, and uh, the opposite one. So what I now do is I define a non-simple bivector capital T, which is the bivector part divided by the scalar part. And it's straightforward to show that that is then uh, the tangent of B1 plus the tangent of B2. And since that is now a non-sample bivector, I know what to do. I can just use our previous solution. Um, and where tau of i is now the t of b i squared, right? This is still a simple bivector, so it follows the exact same pattern. So we could stop at this point, but there's actually a nicer way to formulate this and uh, a very revealing one. Um, we have a theorem in, uh, in the paper, uh, theorem seven, um, which states that the grade two m part of a rotor is um, related to the uh, wedge product of the bivector part wedged m times and then divided by r naught uh, to the power m minus one plus this factorial here. So these components are not independent. The higher ones depend only on the grade zero part and the r uh, two <laughs> part. And that means that for this capital T, I can uh, perhaps re-express this equation. So I start again from uh, our solution. Uh, the tangent of bi is tau i. Uh, plus a half t wedge t divided by t. And now I just use this theorem here to say that that is actually just uh, tau of i uh, times the scalar part of r plus the quad vector part of r divided by the bi vector part. So now it's completely expressed in terms of the rotor um, and not just its bi vector part. And that uh, cleans up some of the exception cases. 
So how do I find the solution now? Again, we know what to do. We square this as we did before. So then again, I get um, this polynomial here whose roots are now tau's of i. Um, so I find that tau 1 and tau 2 are again given um, by this solution here, which is formulated entirely in terms of the rotor. All right. And now it becomes relatively straightforward to find the simple rotors because I know the tangent. Um, once I have this simple tangent uh, of bi, since I know that uh, the rotor itself was c of bi plus the uh, sine of bi, um, I know that if I take a cosine out of the brackets, I'm left with this term 1 plus tau uh, tangent sorry, of bi. And that means that I can obtain my ri as the square root of the tangent of bi, which is just given by 1 plus the tangent normalized. So that is um, now very, a very simple way to find these ri. For boosts and translations, we always consider uh, the positive square root as I've written it here, because we know that for boosts and translations, the uh, scalar part will always have to be larger or equal uh, to one. And then the remaining one, because we want to keep the distinction between plus and negative of the rotor, we don't want to dispose of that information. Um, I will just extract the remaining by reflection by just saying that that is uh, the original R divided by R1. And that keeps the sign intact. And it's also important to note that um, if, our, uh, if the scaling part of R is zero, actually that doesn't cause problems for this algorithm because that means that this um, expression here, our gray, uh, order two polynomial, this term drops out first. So I just have a linear equation to solve. So I can just solve for t, uh, tau one, and then I can extract my first tangent. I don't know if I still said it, no. I can just then extract my uh, first tangent function and then uh, use this trick here to get the remainder. So that brings me again to the, the simplest example, that of mossy Schell's theorem. Um, every three-dimensional rigid body motion can be decomposed in a translation along a line followed or preceded by a rotation around the same line. And so, again, remembering that the pseudo-scalar in this space squared to zero, um, I simply get that tau one is always given by um, the bivector part uh, dotted with itself divided by the scalar part squared, and the last one will always be zero in PGA. And that means I can immediately find that uh, the second rotor corresponding to the zero eigenvalue is actually just one plus the quad vector part divided by the bivector part, which is very neat. And then the remainder is just dividing that term out of the original rotor. And remember that uh, since we have this relationship, r equals e to the b, um, in this space, we also found for bivectors that um, we also have this very uh, simple solution that b2 is b wedge b divided by 2b, and then we have the other one. So in 3D PGA, this, the formulas become extremely simple, which allows you to immediately implement a mossy shell theorem uh, to get these commuting translations and rotations. All right, so just briefly in summary, although I think I've explained this uh, um, all now, um, to, to compute the exponential of a bivector, so that means I start with a bivector, I want its exponential. What I do is I first split it into these two simple terms where the lambda are given by this equation here. And then I can just use the fact that um, each of these uh, bi can be exponentiated directly using Euler's formula, so we already know how to do that. And to compute the logarithm of a quad reflection uh, in a four-dimensional subspace, we just compute the tangent decomposition first. And once I have these simple tangents, I know uh, that my first rotor is one plus uh, tangent of one, and uh, the other one uh, is obtained straightforwardly. And then we, as we discussed in the very beginning, the logarithm of a simple rotor is uh, given by this simple equation. So now we have a closed form solution for both the exponential and the logarithm, but only in 4D subspaces so far. 
But now, of course, we want to know if this generalizes to higher dimensions. Can we extend this idea mm -hmm. and find a closed form for the exponential and the logarithm uh, in all uh, n dimensions? And so let's, let's take one step up in um, difficulty. Um, what about 6D? So then we know that it can actually, uh, the bivector can actually be decomposed into at most three simple uh, commuting bivectors, B1, B2, and B3. And now we take uh, the same characteristic polynomial approach that we did before. And this is very easily extendable. I have the same part I had before, but now I just add this extra term, B3 minus BI for the uh, next one. And so if you just uh, compute every, uh, multiply everything out, um, we get all these combinations and we just play a, a game of recognition. This B1, B2, B3 term, that is actually, if you compute it, B wedge, B wedge, B, but I have to divide by three factorial. Um, this term here, if you work it out, is just a half B wedge, B times the original BI. And uh, the term here, we recognize the original uh, by vector B again, and we just have this uh, remainder. And now I can solve again for BI. So I get this expression in 60, right? It has a very similar structure to the previous one, right? So in 60, what changes is I get, I just get this extra term B wedge B wedge B um, divided by one of the three factorial um, and also a lambda appears here, but other than that, the structure is very similar. And so I think we start to see a pattern of what is happening, right? It, it appears to be that quantities of the type B wedge, B wedge, B wedge, B, M times divided by M factorial might play an important role. So we give that a name, WM, where the W stands for the wedge, M wedges. And now I can show you the general result. Um, so in M uh, dimensions, if I have a k uh, sorry, a, a bivector in n dimensions can be decomposed into at most uh, k um, is uh, the floor of n over two commuting orthogonal two blades, so simple bivectors. So b is this sum up to k, where each of these is simple, so they uh, their product is just the wedge, and therefore they are orthogonal and they commute and they all square to scalars. So again, with this uh, notation of WM being all these wedges, um, and I should also note that W0 is then just one, so that one is included in the set, then the solutions to the characteristic polynomial um, are simply, well, not simply, but are given <laughs> uh, by this expression BI. Um, there is a distinction between K even and K odd, as we saw, the denominator and the uh, numerator flip depending on the value of k. Um, but it is, in principle, you can work it out and uh, the proof uh, and further explanation can be found in the paper. And I should remark that the only reason for this distinction between even and odd is because I also want to include the possibility that lambda i can be zero, as we've seen that it is in pseudo-Euclidean spaces like 3D PGA. If you don't care about that distinction, you can use either one of the two because it won't, uh, they can be shown to be the same. Um, so again, how do we obtain the values of lambda i? We square the solution that we found, and after some uh, careful rearranging, we find that that is actually equal to uh, the sum over these terms uh, w m squared, and then take its scalar part times minus uh, lambda i to the uh, k minus m. And if you work that out carefully, you can show that that is equivalent to just uh, the polynomial b1 squared minus lambda i, b2 squared minus lambda i, et cetera, which it ought to be. Um, and this last polynomial was also, again, already uh, published by David Hestinus. Um, but the solution for finding the simple terms there was different, but the polynomial for finding the eigenvalues is the same one. So that's a good. Uh, confirmation that we're on the right track. Um, and one thing that ought to be mentioned is that the solution uh, depends on the existence then of these inverse, right? I just took the one here from the even case, but I could have equivalently done the odd case. Um, this inverse needs to exist in order for this solution to exist. 
And it turns out that whenever you have degenerate lambda i, so with an algebraic multiplicity larger than one, then this inverse doesn't exist and this algorithm cannot be applied. Um, I would also just like to, uh, as an implementation tip, give that um, how do you determine when to stop? Because if I have, an, let's say I have a 10 dimensional space, but I only consider a quad reflection. So really I wouldn't go further than uh, the case I showed you before, the 4D subspace. Um, and all the other lambdas you will find will be zero, but they will be zero simply because there's no such term present. But you can also have a zero which is meaningful, like the one we have in 3D PGA. Sometimes the lambda zero is actually corresponds to a bivalent. So the reason, so the way you, uh, if you would implement it, is <clears throat> you check what uh, the highest grade non-zero WM is, and that gives you the grade of the K reflection. So that would be the numerical check to make sure when to stop. And then any lambda zero you find after that is still a valid and meaningful term. Um, so now, I don't know why well, it's going to be fine timing wise, I think. Um, <clears throat> I, I go in the opposite direction. Um, so I start from a 2K reflection. And now I also know that in n dimensions, that should be decomposable into a product of uh, K simple by reflections. And we now have a strategy in hand. We want to uh, find these tangent functions of the simple ones. So I, oops, I follow exactly the same strategy as before. I define this uh, non-simple bivector T, which is the uh, bivector part of the row divided by R, uh, R naught, sorry. And um, again, we use our theorem from before, and I'll save you uh, the details on, on um, how to work that out, but then you find that if um, that these WMs, and I put up uh, multiplied it with the scalar part of R naught for uh, simplicity, you find then that this product is just um, T to the power M, and then you take the 2M part, right? That's just what we already had, but then using this theorem, you find that that is actually just the two, uh, grade 2M part of the rotor. And so then I immediately find for the solution of TBI that I can always write it in terms of uh, grades of the rotor and these lambda i's. Uh, again, the distinction between k, uh, k even and k odd uh, appears. So then I also do the same trick for the square. We square this again, and then we know how to find the values of tau. Oh, sorry. I, See here, I, this is not lambda, this should have been tau here to avoid confusion. Um, so the eigenvalues here, tau for the tangents, uh, again, are expressible purely in terms of uh, the rotor itself. And then we know what to do next. Um, we find all the simple rotors but one uh, by taking the square root of the tangent function, which was just uh, one plus the tangent of bi normalized. And then uh, we do that for all but one. And then we divide all of those out of the original to get the remainder. So we keep the distinction between plus and minus r. So we have now found that any 2k reflection can be decomposed into k commuting orthogonal reflection by reflections and that any 2k plus 1 reflection can be decomposed into a commuting and orthogonal reflection and the 2k reflection. So now we can really decompose any number of reflections into commuting parts. And um, additionally, we found that the 2k reflection is generated by a non-simple bivector, um, which can then be decomposed into k of these orthogonal um, commuting simple bivectors. All right, and that brings me to the last slide. Um, so just a brief conclusion and, and outlook. Um, so we found that, um, and that's uh, explained more explicitly in the paper for those that are interested, that both isometries and the elements of geometry, the points, lines, planes, uh, can be expressed as K reflections. We extended the notion of a pin group to uh, pin PQR to include this extra R, because if you do it that way, we can include the pseudo Euclidean group. So we can detach ourselves from the origin and model the entire space. 
Um, any K reflection we found can be decomposed into K over two, uh, seal K over two commuting simple factors, which could be uh, either all by reflections or by reflections and one reflection. And we found an algorithm for performing this decomposition, um, which uh, works in all cases except when you have degenerate eigenvalues. Um, so not for uh, isoclinic rotations. Um, but otherwise, um, all the cases are covered. And so um, what this invariant decomposition enabled us to do in the first place um, was uh, to give descriptions for closed form exponential and logarithmic functions for elements of uh, spin PQR, the Lie algebra, or for the group uh, spin PQR, uh, respectively. And from the seminal paper, uh, Lie groups as spin groups by Doran and David Hestemus um, and others, um, we know that all the classical Lie groups can be modeled as spin groups. So therefore, it stands to reason that the invariant decomposition applies to all classical Lie groups. And in fact, that is uh, the technique I used in the SU3 paper that was also referenced by uh, Anthony earlier, uh, where I already applied this decomposition to SU3. Um, some ideas going forward. Um, the invariant decomposition also exists for isoclinic rotations, but you just uh, don't have the same closed form solution, but its existence is not uh, a problem. So in principle, if you confine the solution, you can be happy. It's no longer unique, but that, that's even better. You can just find anyone. Um, so if you have an efficient algorithm for just getting to a solution, uh, that would be uh, great to have. Um, what's also interesting is the application to partial differential equations and, uh, for example, spherical harmonics, as uh, referenced by Anthony uh, Lazenby in his talk earlier. Um, Joan also talked about um, a geometric algebra approach to orthogonal transformations and their use in signal and imaging processing. And um, she already mentioned that there you have, they use the KD map, but something like a closed form exponential and logarithm might be very interesting to consider. Um, and yeah, the relationship with Anthony's talk this morning, um, which uh, uh, I found very interesting. And I think there's some uh, deep links to be investigated there between the two approaches. Um, and perhaps your application here. So what I would like to say is go forth and decompose. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Um, are there any questions in the room? Questions? <laughs> Could you show me the slide six, please? Uh, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Uh, was it 1.6 or 2.6? I, I, I think let us try 2.6 perhaps. <coughs> when you got the imag imaginary. Solution, I imagine. Then it's 1.6? That's the Right. So, just as a uh, sort of curiosity. You were wondering, uh, in the case of imaginary solutions, uh, what's, what's going on there? Possible, it's just as I suspect, that is a solution in, in the conic, which is imaginary solutions. I don't know, you have to, to think. Yeah, well, what, what it shows, I think, is we need, in these cases, an extra degree of freedom uh, to find a solution. So, so that's why we need to expand the space somehow. And in this case, uh, the unit imaginary does the trick. Uh, but, but perhaps it's possible to consider other spaces, but we just need a larger space in order to find the solution. So that's it. Right, my second question is, um, of course, it's, a, yeah, it's a just to <laughs> prove. Uh, you mentioned at the very end that, that this, uh, all, all the general linear uh, uh, legal. Um, Can you use the microphone? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Well, I think it's yeah. on, but sorry. just use it. Yeah. Um, you said that the as a, as a conclusion that you, the, the composition approach can handle all the general linear group. Uh, right. It's just classical. the cl class. So my question, of course, is a bit redundant, but uh, how about these uh, um, these pathological groups? The most, the most, the exception. 
Yeah, yeah, right. And some, some people call it pathologic as well, right? But the exceptional group, right? What's yeah. your opinion about that? Well, yeah, we haven't uh, considered that uh, in detail yet. But yeah, that, that's why I'm very careful to say in classical legal groups. Exactly. Uh, right. Because right. Uh, I do know that Chris Durand was uh, working on something like that as well. So um, perhaps there's some possibility to use this technique. Uh, but, but I can't comment on that in any detail. Good. Thank you. I give, I give. Okay. So presumably when you get to the larger groups, then there's the problem that you can't solve the characteristic equation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah, mean, perhaps numerically. Well, of course, yes, numerically. But yeah. uh, what one might hope there is some sort of factorization occurs automatically due to the group structure. That would be mm. very mm -hmm. good if that did occur. Yeah, if there's some kind of simplifying yeah. principle already. Yeah, it's yeah, a good remark. <laughs> so. <laughs> so this morning, Anthony uh, showed that he had a similar equation to yours, but things occurred in a squared form. Yes. Isn't, isn't that the solution or the way to avoid mm -hmm. having to introduce the complex numbers? Yeah, because that, now the square would just be negative, but you never would go to the, to sure. the square so root. Indeed, uh, I, I was going to try this particular example in what I'm doing, uh, but I haven't done it yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's all very fresh, uh, but that's why we're here, right? Uh, can you hand the micro microphone to the back there? There's another. It's It should be on it's anyway, sure? yeah. Okay, um, uh, thank you for a very nice talk. Um, now that you are in, on that slide, uh, I had uh, uh, another motivation, but I started from uh, R13 space, which was is a STA, uh, and then expanded to uh, if the first number is for positive and the second number for negative, uh, extended to R. Um, two, three, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, everything can be done real, and you can have everything uh, working, incorporating, for example, the the momentum operator uh, into the uh, into this uh, uh, real uh, vector space. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, for that reason, I believe that if you you're starting from two, two. You can go to two, three factors, and yeah. that will be guaranteed that it will work, I believe. Yes. If you uh, find the natural... Uh, the exact same still... Uh, <laughs> if you find the, the exact same thing still extension. applies in uh, 5D spaces, actually. So everything I said here was for 4D subspaces, but it doesn't mean, uh, it doesn't matter of what it is a subspace. Yeah. So if you have a 5D one, uh, actually the same decomposition still apply. Yeah. But for example, in your case of uh, 2 comma 3, that means you have the possibility to have a 2 comma 2 type subspace of 4D. Yeah, it could yeah. be embedded in that subspace or it could be in the 1 free uh, yeah. subspace. Yes. And those will behave uh, differently, but but all the solutions will work. This solution will uh, just smoothly uh, cover all those cases. Yeah, I think so. Thank okay. you. We have a question on the chat by Eckhart. Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. OK. Um, uh, good that this slide is still up, uh, and there is this value for lambda i, which might be complex. But I think the complexity simply means the i should square to minus one, isn't it? That's what it means to be complex. Oh, sorry. That's yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, but that that is my answer as well. <laughs> okay. Okay. But that that's very good because uh, these um, geometric algebras have many elements and not only blades that square to minus one. And these are continuous manifolds of elements that square to minus one of usually mm -hmm. half the dimension of the algebra. Mm -hmm. So you could look into this um, up to dimension four, uh, co compute them explicitly and see if, if mm -hmm. you find a suitable element there no um I, i've tried so within that algebra you won't find a suitable one uh, it really needs to be one which commutes with uh, all the uh, elements of the even separate algebra that you have and um it, so and you don't have one of those because for example the pseudo scalar in that space squares to plus one so that can't do the job although it commutes mm -hmm. 
and you don't have an element which commutes uh, with all the other ones and behaves like an imaginary. Um, so you actually need an external one. So you need to either go to a larger embedding space or just use the I that we always use in, in calculus, um, which I um, found to be the most straightforward solution because also um, if you implement this numerically, your software will already know how to deal with complex numbers. Um, so the implementation effort is very small. Can I, um, can I make but, a comment? Is it, uh, is it sure that it uh, needs yeah. to commute with the whole algebra? Yes. With the even subalgebra, with those bivectors, yeah. Oh, with the even subalgebra, okay, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Can I okay. add something, Leo? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I, I did actually, uh, first of all, thanks for the talk in the papers. It's great, great stuff. I did send through some work to Stephen, but I, unfortunately I put it on Slack and he, he seems to sort of disengage, so I'll, I'll, I'll resend it. That particular example you've got, actually what's going on is quite straightforward. Mm -hmm. The I that you introduce essentially combines with the F1, F2, the two things are square to negative. Mm -hmm. It generates Euclidean vectors and then you just you just turn the handle and see if you're in Euclidean. Space. Yes. Um, but but that is also uh, only true because I we picked a very like a simple example where the um, eigenvalues are purely imaginary, but they could be complex numbers in general, and then you can't do that anymore. No, it, it'll always work out because once you've decided, once you've allowed yourself to work over the complex field, you just mm -hmm. change the basis to Euclidean basis. It's a standard Euclidianization trick we do in quantum mechanics all the time. So, and it, what it does is it leaves you an interesting choice in these balanced spaces. Yeah, you have to decide mm -hmm. what what you're prepared to live with. Um, either you can generate, you can decompose your bivectors into commuting sections. But they're not quite blades. They're sort of self-dual and anti-self-dual. But then you keep everything real, mm -hmm. and things commute, and you can work. Or you you suck it up and you accept this complexification. I think it kind of depends on the application. Yeah. The, the, the other thing I did say to Stephen, which he didn't he didn't read, um, but I'll forward on to you. Uh, during lockdown, we all found various ways to keep ourselves busy. Uh, <laughs> I've managed to figure out the bivector Lie algebra for the exceptional group F. Four now, so that is all sitting, waiting to be done. It lives in a twenty-eight dimensional space, so there's some interesting numerical challenges there. But should should be well within your um, uh, well within the capabilities of your code. So when we get when we can reconvene next week, I'll send through the details of that, and maybe we can have a go at seeing if you do get some nice, interesting decompositions. Mm -hmm. Okay, Chris, I'll also make sure to check my Slack. I completely <laughs> forgot about that. I'm sorry. You've been Slack. Yeah. <laughs> I've been slacking. So Apologies. why was it called plain and simple? Um, well, plain and simple because we've taken this perspective of using hyperplanes as vectors, which has really helped us think about all of this. And simple because, yeah, because of all the simple by vectors. How hard can it be, really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so are there any implementations of this now? Yes, actually. So it's already in Ganja.js in the uh, live version now. Uh, I have a pull request for uh, Clifford and there's uh, another person who did it for, um, what's it called again? TensorFlow GA. Yeah. Okay. So that also already has a, um, an implementation. And does this include the uh, isoclinic exception that you sort of discovered after Monday? Uh, that guy, Tora, is his nickname on Discord. Again, we don't know how these people are actually called. Okay, Robin. Um, he did that. So he, he actually found a solution for that and um, uh, implemented it. Okay, one, one last remark and then we go to lunch. Thanks a lot. Have you ever thought about the following? If you would take the linear equation for your hyperplane, then you square it, then you get a, an equation for a cone exception. A cone. For instance, if there is only one such generator that uh, squares to minus one, you get uh, yeah the, the typical cone. And now uh, you can think of a projective in a projective way or, or about these things because uh, the, the parameter 
uh, of the plane that sets your distance to the origin that can be arbitrary. Yeah, and mm -hmm. this would be maybe interesting. So your planes are actually some rays on a light cone, or so in four dimensions. Mm -hmm. Well, what you can do also is this projective dimension. We we just took it to square to zero because we want the pseudo Euclidean spaces in this okay, case. Okay. But you could change the signature on that one to get a uh, hyperbolic or elliptic spaces mm. without, without having to change any of uh, the algorithm or the code. Yes. <laughs> okay, guys, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>